speak. Uh, Steve Ellis, he is an associate professor at the University of Cincinnati. And like I said, he lives here. He has many awards. I won't go into all that because we'll be here all night. And I know we want to hear him. Uh, but it, it's just a thrill to have him here because he is an expert when it comes to, this, to Pompeii. I've been there uh, about 10 years ago. It is just an unbelievable place. If you ever get to Italy, go there. It's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, they had their own plumbing systems. They, they had brothels. They had all kind of crazy <laughs> stuff there that they're uncovering. So with further ado, Steve, if you'll come up and take over. for the invitation uh, to be here and I know that uh, it's uh, kind of getting on the night so I'll try to be as, as brief as possible um, in talking about the work that we're doing um, at Pompeii through the University of Cincinnati. So I know I've got about you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like this yeah. um, until people start to nod off. Uh, if I go a little bit too quickly or if my accent becomes a little too um, uh, impenetrable, uh, just, just let me know. Um, I'm, I'm sure this is a pretty informal affair, so sing out to me, throw something at me, and I'll sort of slow down or, or re-explain um, what it is that we're doing. So um, to give some of the, I thought I'd give some, a little bit of a background first as to you know, what it is that we, the University of Cincinnati and myself are doing um, at, at Pompeii uh, with this research that we've been there since uh, 2005, so about, about 10 years and have a handful more years to go. Uh, I am a, a Roman archaeologist and I specialise in um, principally in, in urbanization, Roman cities. And so that means that I, I look mostly at, at kind of urban communities, networks, social networks, and the way that, that, that cities are, are formed, are built, like literally built in terms of the, the fabric of the materials, the structural mater uh, materials that they go to building up a city from all the floors and all the fills to level the land, the, the, the material that's used to build the, the, the construction of the buildings, etc. Um, right through to then the sort of the social structures too, sort of how, how are these organized, how are cities organized, how are they, uh, are they zoned, how do, how do they work in terms of the social stratigraphy, etc, etc. So I'll come back a little bit to that um, uh, in, in a moment, but just to give you an idea, this is where I work. Uh, so I, I work mostly um, in, in this part of Italy here at Pompeii, which we'll spend some time at, but in order to understand Pompeii, I also have to go work at a bunch of other Roman cities as well, so these are all the sites um, I've been working at uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. So it means that I, it, there's a lot of traveling involved and, and what I try to do is to visit and, and to um, do research at as many different kinds of Roman cities as possible. There are, there's about a thousand year um, span in terms of urbanization that I, that I look at. So what um, I'm ultimately left faced with is sort of trying to kind of reconcile the different kinds of, of cities that we find whether it's in France or Spain or Greece or Turkey or, or this one here. This is actually a fantastic site um, in Algeria. This was a, it was an amazing trip. Uh, I went with about 10 archaeologists when we were there. We were the only, uh, I guess, tourists you would call us um, in the entire country at that time. We had to have uh, uh, two armed vehicles, one in front, one behind, and armed guards take us throughout the entire country looking at this amazing archaeology. So it was an incredible um, experience. But you know, combining that kind of trip, the same, same site right here, right in the middle of absolute nowhere. Um, it was quite an incredible place. Uh, but looking at, at, at elsewhere, you know, Tunisia or Spain or France, and, and trying to kind of reconcile the different kinds of Roman cities that we're left with. Ultimately, because what I'm about to get to is, is of course, Pompeii. And I guess the, 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 the easy part for me in standing up in front of a group of people and to talk about Pompeii is that you know, most of us will understand that it was a city that was destroyed by a volcano in 79 AD. And that kind of the story that, that goes with it is that what we're left with is a kind of a, a city that's frozen in time. And, and a lot of archaeologists try to sort of um, sophisticate that more, add, add some more complexity to that, that description of a city that was, that was frozen in time. But the more, and, and, I, and I must admit, I did that myself as a, as a graduate student. I thought, oh, we can, do, we can do better than that. It was a much more complex story. But the more and more I look at these other Roman cities, the more and more I realize that actually... This is the, sort of the, the, the general public, the National Geographic view of Pompeii is actually more right um, than, than the academics like to, like to admit to. Because once you start looking at these other, other cities here, what you're left with, uh, so on the one hand you've got Pompeii that is destroyed pretty much overnight. Um, and even though people came back to the city, they came back and they looted it, they pillaged it, um, 
And even though parts of the site were mined for building material in the following centuries, it's still ostensibly what you have is a city that was never relived in. Okay, so we don't get that. Um, we don't get the sort of the rise of a city, its, its ebbs and flows, and then ultimate decline to become an archaeological site. Because by definition, you can't have an archaeological site unless you've got, in terms of a city, unless it, it, it has declined. It has to become some kind of you know, a city, a, t a town, a city. It has to start to sort of go downhill, um, start to tank, as it were. It has to become something of a kind of a ghost town before it can be then become an archaeological site. So I've been thinking about how that that very basic premise shapes the kinds of archaeology that I'm looking at. Because I'm, lo I'm looking mostly at a subaltern um, uh, Roman city. So I'm looking at not just the, the um, so everything of Pompeii, the, the, the kind of textbook version, the coffee table book version of Pompeii with its largest, most handsomely decorated houses with the wall paintings and mosaics. That's all great stuff and I, I do like to look at that too. But what I'm mostly looking at and trying to contribute towards is the other 99.5% of the population. So I'm looking at, at neighborhoods, I'm looking at, at the, wouldn't call them the middle class, but sort of middling groups, those who existed just below the most powerful families, but, but certainly above the subsistence level. And so what we're trying to do with our project, which I'll, we'll get there in a moment, um, is to try to find new ways of measuring um, uh, urban living standards, uh, et cetera. So I'll, sort of, I'll, I'll show you how that works in, in a moment. So these sorts of cities help me to to, I guess, contextualize Pompeii. So it's very easy when you work at Pompeii because it's such an extraordinary site. Uh, the, the, the material, the culture there, it's, it's uh, people would call it incomparable, but you can see here there are certainly other very fabulous Roman cities. Here we are now at, at Pompeii. Um, then we tend to uh, uh, treat Pompeii separately as, a, as an isolated case. And what I guess what I'm trying to do is to try to connect it to the bigger Roman world. And that's what our project is, is all about. So, um, so broadly speaking, the, the, the kind of questions that brought me to looking to, at Pompeii um, in the first place, to, to setting up this project in 2005, um, uh, was to uh, look at the kind of history and urban development of, of a city. That's kind of the easy um, answer. And that was one of the sort of the first questions that we had: was how, how did Pompeii get to where it was in 79 AD when it was destroyed? So, as, as, as any town, whether it's whether it's Cincinnati. Ohio or Sydney, Australia, you've got kind of a, a several hundred years of urbanization. That's what you've got here at Pompeii as well. Several hundred years of urbanization. It didn't all just pop up there sort of overnight like some newfangled suburb or something like this. Um, instead, what we've got is uh, uh, several hundred years of kind of patchwork development and very episodic development as well. It's never um, gradual. It's never slowly but surely. It's always very episodic. Uh, I, guess, I guess the history of Cincinnati um, speaks to something like that uh, as, as well. Look at the product of downtown Cincinnati. It represents different periods of, of sort of socioeconomic um, uh, 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 jumps. Um, also trying to look at infrastructure and waste management. So we're looking not just at, at the houses and the shops and the workshops that make up this neighborhood that we're excavating, but also looking at the streets, looking at drainage, looking at fortification, looking at all the bits and pieces that help to, to, for, for a city to function over time and the relationships between those, those parts of, of the town, so in terms of what is waste, what, what, is, what is trash and refuse or whatever word we want to give to it, um, what, 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 what collected in that sense and what did they do with that material and how did they reuse that material. So looking at issues of infrastructure and waste um, and then also looking uh, very much at social, at social stratigraphy. So again, not just looking at the, at the, at the elites of of the town, which has attracted most attention in terms of Pompeii and archaeology, those, those large, um, very well decorated homes, but looking at um, sort of the full range, as, as much of a full range as possible uh, of, of a city, and trying to figure out, well, how does all this different kind of social texture um, work together? How, how do the networks operate? How do the people work together? How do the different kinds of families? Um, and how does all that um, reflect itself in the archaeology of a city and in the kind of the shaping of, of the development of a city as well? And then, I, I guess, last, lastly, the, the, the kind of the context for all of this. So looking at those developments of all the different families. So ultimately, we've been looking at a neighborhood down here in Pompeii. This is the neighborhood here that we have. It's about 4,500 square meters of, of these houses and shops and workshops and all the, all the bits and pieces that made up a, an ancient city. And looking at the families that, that developed those different buildings, different um, building plots. We have 
Um, we have about 10 different building plots, building, building property lines, about 20 different shops. So we can look at all the different kinds of decisions that went into um, operating those, um, those businesses. And looking at how, how they then responded to <coughs> local, so Pompeian-wide changes or, or, or regional, and say, central Italian or even Italian, um, and Mediterranean-wide socioeconomic and historical changes. So when we, when we, when we recognize things that are happening and responses, what, what are they responding to? And so I'll show you some examples of, of that. So to bring us to, to Pompeii, so this gives you a sense of, um, of the site from above, the fortification walls are around here. We are working down in this neighborhood here, so I can zoom in for a moment, zoom into that neighborhood here. Uh, it's, a, it's a very large kind of entertainment district. We have this large, uh, 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 very big public space called a quadriporticus here, a big theater, a smaller theater. Actually, the smaller theater is much more important than the bigger theater. Uh, it was the biggest space to have a roof in all of Pompeii. Um, uh, and then we are working, we're, excav uh, we're working on that whole area, but our excavations are particularly in this little zone here, I would say little zone, quite a, quite a large zone. It's the largest pocket of Pompeii ever to be excavated, um, uh, systematically excavated in terms of archaeologically excavated um, in the history of the site. So while the site itself has been systematically exposed from all the volcanic material that buried it in 79 AD, um, this is the first project that is trying to then record that information and go down underneath it. So what we do is that we, we, we've dug all of these trenches all these archaeological trenches, so we go down through the layers, all the different floor surfaces um, and, and features and different buildings that are underneath, that, so you can find ultimately, I guess, it doesn't really work this way, but, but kind of metaphorically, if you look at a city as being kind of an inverted pyramid, you can start with sort of this, this, this final version and go down through all the different versions under that, and that should be sort of smaller and smaller and smaller, and so on and so forth. So if we come into looking at some of these trenches, what we're then left with is... Um, uh, I guess the, the stratified deposits. So we, we dig down through um, all these different features and different floor surfaces, and what they will, if we, if we do it right, if we record it correctly and, and understand it as best we can, and it's certainly not easy. None, none of this stuff comes with a, with a label or a tag, and so it requires a lot of um, uh, 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 thinking, I guess, <laughs> and interpretation. If we go through this material, we can ultimately try to recognize then these phases of development. Um, so you can say, okay, they had a floor here, they had a, they had a, they had a fish tank going with it, they're salting fish with it, walls over here, walls over there, and then for some reason they've knocked it all down, uh, raised the level, and put a new surface in, and so on and so forth. So we see actually about seven different um, principal phases uh, over about 600 years of, of history here at, in, this part of, in this part of Pompeii. Um, more particularly how we do it is that we, we start from the top. So we start... Um, it's kind of like a bumper stick for archaeologists, right? Archaeologists start at the top. Um, uh, is that we start looking at the, at the architecture, so we started by looking at, uh, in fact, when we first arrived, the entire area was just a jungle, a complete jungle. It was first cleared of its volcanic debris in the very late 1800s and early um, uh, 1900s, and, and just basically left the dead. It, it didn't have all of the kinds of large um, houses we've been talking about, but instead was filled up with a very much more... Uh, uh, kind of a, what, they, what they term a lowly zone of Pompeii. And that's the reason why I wanted to go there in the very first place. So when I started this project, I was particularly looking for a neighborhood like this. And it's the largest such neighborhood to be without elite, uh, and a kind of an elite zone or, or elite uses of space um, in, in the area. Uh, and that was, that was good for the questions that I had, this new kind of contribution I wanted to make to, to, to Pompeian history and to Roman history. And it was also good because it hadn't been touched before. So it was a completely lost neighborhood, and the, the area hadn't even been mapped yet um, uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. So we start from the top, we do things like aerial photography and um, uh, our ground penetrating radar, so we look down all the different slices as best we can before we even dig in different areas to see if there's any area that, that might attract us um, uh, than, than others. Um, these days, actually, I mean, this, this kind of machine here is, uh, as we know, architectural engineering is uh, uh, what it basically does. It sends out a little laser, right? And so, so uh, this, is, this is the old, I need to update this slide because what this would do is send up this little laser onto a wall and it would record that dot on the wall in three dimensions and bring that dot back into a computer. You do several hundred of those in a day, then you can sort of join the dots and join the lines and you've got a kind of a mesh of that part of the wall that you've surveyed in. These days, um, we now put one of these machines in the ground and it just spins around. And so what that guy was collecting was you know, several hundred points in a day 
this thing collects about 15 million points in about three minutes. So uh, he's out of a job now, but no, he's, 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 uh, he's, uh, we, we just sort of updated different um, kinds of technologies. And even that now is, is um, kind of outdated, outmoded as well, as while we've been going up and up and up in terms of the technology that we use, we've had a, a big revolution in the last few years whereby the technology is becoming much cheaper um, and, and easy to use, kind of do-it-yourself methods, particularly thanks to things like iPads and tablet technology um, as well. So this kind of machine here costs about $125,000. I don't like buying these things because they cost a lot of money. Um, and you can only find sort of one person in, in some little far-flung town who knows how to actually use the thing. These days, now we can actually um, use uh, uh, iPads to do just as good a job. startling the changes that are happening to, to Pompeii with this. What this does is it creates this kind of 3D space, right? So that we can then come to Pompeii um, and our site, which which ordinarily looks like this, it's been destroyed here. Um, by getting this picture of the Pompeii, we can then lift it up with reconstructions of the space. So we're not just imagining in our mind's eye how the space looked and worked. We can actually create these kinds of models. Um, I didn't create that one myself, it's filled with mistakes, but our friends, National Geographic, um, did that for a documentary they, they were um, filming on our, on our work fairly recently. They still show it on TV and stuff like this, but um, this gives an idea, it's just some of the, the technologies that we're using now. We've had a lot of attention for that, um, thanks to Steve Jobs himself, who, uh, who, who caught on to that we were using these earlier on. I got a phone call from him one night, and the first time using the iPad, and, and they got involved with our work um, very early, from, from 2010. So we've had this kind of relationship with Apple um, and the iPad ever since. Uh, right to very recently where we went and shot a, a TV commercial for the Super Bowl, um, which they never actually ended up using for the Super Bowl. Um, it was incredible. It was an amazing experience to go out and shoot a Super Bowl commercial, and then they didn't air it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, they put it on their, on their website and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun um, to, to do that. So we look at, we, so we look at the architecture and the space. Um, we excavate... Uh, is that right if I move this bit? Oh, we don't lose much anyway, do we? Um, so uh, so we, we dig down through these different layers to give you an idea of how that sort of works. Here's a wall here, a very early wall, and here's the, the floor they, they cut in to build the wall. You can see the cut in here. They've built this trench and they built the wall, and there's the material they throw back in the side. That's what an archaeologist is. Bread and butter. Really great, great kind of stuff. Probably really boring to yourselves. Um, you want to see some mosaics and wall paintings, but um, that kind of uh, is is most of what we're after in looking at, at the site. Uh, we have a conservation lab on site, so materials that we're finding from the coins to the little um, sea urchin spines and everything in between, we, we try to conserve um, as best possible. Uh, we, we float uh, a lot of our material as well. So when we're digging up the dirt out of the ground, we 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 float it so that we're not just picking stuff out with our eyes or with a screen where you put the dirt through through like a like a sieve um, and sieve it for all the little artifacts. We also float it through a series of water tanks and that pulls out all the bio-organic um, remains uh, as well. So we're able to then do things like reconstruct uh, our diets and, and look at the environmental um, impacts on the site over, over time and see the changes that way. Because ultimately, um, what we're left with when we, when we dig down through all of those kind of Volumetric matrix, all the stuff that goes to building a city, um, is is that the, the very great majority of it is materials that we use to, to build the city in, in construction of the space. So there's this great big misunderstanding, not just in the general public, certainly not, but, but certainly even in archaeological circles, that what we find when we're digging up these buildings is what was actually used in those spaces. And so we've been able to use show from this this project by digging up so much of this site. So it's one of the largest. Roman archaeological projects ever um, uh, executed is that is that the, the far majority of what we find is actually refuse that has been created by some space around that part of Pompeii, removed out to a, into a into a trash pile, a refuse heap, into a midden, whatever you want to call it, and then ultimately brought back in to then rebuild the city um, over time. So that's kind of helped us to understand different things, but not entirely. We still have these these little gems here and there that help us understand much more about the use of that particular shop or that particular restaurant, for example. Um, 
So we have plenty of things like cesspits and latrines. And it's a really local, it's still trash, I suppose, but it's very localized um, trash. Um, and, and drains as well help us, because we know the, the inlet into the drain that comes from a kitchen. Uh, and from that we've been able to find all sorts of things, uh, uh, lots of organic remains, and everything from spices that come from Sri Lanka, uh, to uh, uh, sub-Saharan animals, like the, the butchered leg joint of a giraffe as well. So inc incredible um, uh, range of material. And all of it tells us something about the, the complexity and the, and the richness of, of everything from the diet to, to the networks to be able to get this kind of material. Um, and also helps us, I think, to, to kind of re-question what this material is doing there in the first place. Um, why should a, a so-called sub-elite district be eating foods that come from all these different areas? Either we have to um, refigure, re reevaluate whether food and identity actually match up like that, or we have to find new ways of understanding the urbanite experience. Do we have, uh, 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 there's certainly not elites there, there are people who are living much better than our friends who are living here, but certainly they don't seem to be doing it that badly um, as well, uh, in, at least in terms of, of food, if we can use that as a gauge. And so um, all of this work is not just helping us to, to I guess to galvanize ideas that we've already had, but actually to challenge them, um, or at least question them as, as well. So we go from looking at, at the little bits and pieces of food scraps that might be found in a toilet or, or in a drain, um, to looking at the structures as well as we're digging down through these different, different periods and different phases. So some examples of that might be uh, these here. We found a whole series of, of fish salting workshops. And these were fascinating to find. We, they were recognized by these great big vats that exist right in front of the threshold into these shops. And they were all built at about the same time, about the second century BCE. And that's kind of interesting to some degree. More interesting still is that for all of them we found up and down the sides of, of the roads here, is that they all went out of use at precisely the same time. Well, I say precisely, archaeologically precisely. Um, it's about the Augustan period. It's the period of the, the, the turn of the millennium, so the first years of the first century AD. Um, and what was interesting about that was that they didn't all just go out of use, but what, basically what happened was they were all filled up with debris um, here, the, 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 the tank here was filled up with debris, a floor laid over top of it, a drain runs through this thing now, and the space was given over where it had been production space, salting fish to create things like fish paste, fish paste, and fish sauces, etc., to flavor foods, um, was now given over to retail, exclusively to retail space. We're seeing workshops and production spaces and cottage industry scale workshops um, being replaced with, with shops. A different kind of townscape, different kind of streetscape is happening in this time um, in, in Pompeii's history. So this is a very uh, important discovery that we're able to, to make. And what was interesting I found in, in doing this is that there was there was no single find that told us this, this extraordinary information. It was it was a series of finding a bunch of vats, finding um, a bunch of Spanish um, imported fish sources and Spanish imported uh, fish products that were all coming into Pompeii precisely at the time that our friends here in Pompeii seemed to be going out of business. And we also found um, uh, not so much the fish products themselves in and around the tanks, but in the in the in the in the debris for these phases, we found fish products and fish hooks and things like this, uh, because the actual the actual the actual process itself is is a, a necessarily clean one. Um, it's like like any fish um, fish market. You go to the fish markets in Naples at eight in the morning, and there's fish and blood and guts and scales and everything everywhere. You go back in three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's just wet cement, the whole place is sparkling clean. Um, and the same kind of idea here. So we had to sort of find all different ways of, of measuring these, these changes. And what it ultimately helped us to do was to connect Pompeii's economy um, and the history of these, the livelihoods of these families to a broader economy. Because what was happening at that time was the, the opening up of the Mediterranean under this, this first Emperor Augustus, the first years of the first century AD. Was, was opening up trade and, and was promoting mass production of these kinds of products in Spain. And that started this big sort of tsunami of fish products, cheap, the good quality fish products into Pompeii, uh, into Italy and into Pompeii, and our, our friends here simply couldn't um, compete with it. Well, they, they found ways to compete. What they ultimately did was they um, didn't just shut down, they actually shut down, and then they seemed to have moved outside of the city and competed with the Spanish by doing what they were doing, which were having great big consortiums. So instead of having 
one or two of these dinky little tanks. They now had hundreds of them um, at this point uh, moving on. So this gives you an idea of how big, rich stories can be ultimately told by lots of different sets of data, none of which has a, has a, has a, has a, has a label on it or has an explanation given to it, but you have to bring it all together and try to make sense of it and use a whole series of different kinds of specialists um, on the team. A different example of that, of a, another kind of very rich story uh, I'd like to show is, is this one here, where, where one single artifact actually can yield a, a, a very kind of um, a compelling story of, of the lives and livelihoods of those who lived in, in this neighborhood. This here is, well, I say one artifact, it's, it's two pieces, but it's actually clamped together um, in antiquity. And what it is, is it's kind of very important for me on a, on a kind of professional and personal level um, as well, is it's, uh, it's about this big, it's made of bronze, um, and would have been sealed together with wax, and a little, little sort of string thread, and, and, and a wax seal on it. And it is a, a tiny words up there, you won't be able to read that, I'll tell you, it's a military diploma. A really important um, uh, object for, that, for the person who owned this thing. This is the diploma that was given to somebody who has served the Navy, in this case it's the Navy, for 26 years, and is then given not just their sort of their leave, their, their retirement from the Navy, but also citizenship, um, and also a plot of land as well. It's an amazing document because we can read the Latin that's over all of this, and it tells an incredible story. We only have a few hundred of these things, um, but this is one of only two that we have as much information as, as we had here. It tells us the name um, of this bloke, he is, here we go, Marcus Surus Garasenus. Great, it's a great name because it's a foreign name. He comes from the East, it's a very much an Eastern name. We get the name of his father, we get the name of his mates as well, they're also put, put, put on here. Um, we also find that he was retired, uh, he comes from Antioch, I should say that, he comes from Antioch, that's great, we, we know Antioch as a site um, in the East. And, uh, and he was, uh, uh, what's fascinating about him is that he was, uh, we know the date that he was retired. It was the 5th of April, 71 AD. We know where he was retired to, Pystum. Great, it's an amazing place. Just south um, of, of Pompeii. If we get to Pompeii area, go down further south to Pystum. There's the greatest mozzarella in all of Italy. Uh, it's, it's a big mozzarella zone. It's an amazing place. Beautiful archaeological site right on the beach. Um, he goes there on the 5th of April, 71 AD, armed with this... Um, uh, uh, military diploma and his freedom and he's given a piece of land there on that date. Some point between then and 79 AD he makes his decision to leave Pystum and move to Pompeii. He moves into one of our houses, into one of our bronze smithing uh, houses, a house with a bronze smithing uh, uh, workshop in the back of it and he starts working as a bronze smith um, in, in, in our property. It's fascinating to me at a personal level for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, you know, why does he have this, this uh, a military diploma, he has it because he's foreign. He's been given his citizenship, but he's still a foreigner. So he has to prove, wherever he goes still, that he's not just some kind of runaway slave. In the same way, I should have it on my pocket, it's in my wallet, in my bag. Um, I have to carry, I'm not from around here, you know, I guess. Um, and I can be stopped by any policeman on the street and, show, and, and asked to, to show my passport or my visa, or what I have now is a green card. The same kind of thing as a green card. It's still kind of green too, which I kind of like as well. So uh, uh, he has this thing to prove himself wherever he goes. He, to, he always keeps it with him. And uh, the other kind of personal side of it is is that when uh, we did a, a, another documentary with um, National Geographic came out uh, about, about three years ago now. It's, they still show it on the National Geographic channel. And of all the different stories that they picked up in this sort of one hour episode, um, this was the one that was kind of not meant the most to me because they, they not only told this story of this military diploma, but they actually got an, and they, they reconstructed the building. Here's the building, he's in it right there. There's just some screenshots from it. But they got an actor to play the role of this bloke, this Marcus Soros Garrisonis. And so this story that we've been able to kind of retell through the archaeology is now being retold on, on television uh, with an actor. Some guy's playing the role of this guy that was sort of all bringing back to life. Um, someone who otherwise would have been completely, entirely um, lost to time. So it's kind of a, it's a kind of, there's something rewarding um, in that to, to, to see how that, that, that played out. And then ultimately, so we get stories that come from the little bits and pieces of, of, of food scraps that we might get, from the structural remains that we're looking at as well, 
um, and also from kind of a, a, a combination of all different kinds of artifacts and, and, and structures, or, or just single artifacts as well. And then ultimately, we can put all of this together, what I'm sort of ultimately looking at this neighborhood of 10 different properties, is looking at kind of urban investment and these sort of socio-economic networks. Why do people open up shops? Where, why do they open them up? Where do they open them up? Um, and how does that work in terms of um, the sort of the capital that was required for these kinds of shops to open, the networks that were required to, to access the products, to access everything from the charcoal that was used to heat the ovens, to heat the kitchens, to cook the food. This stuff is, is, is we, we take it for granted, of course, uh, but in the ancient world, this was a, a very important commodity. So everything from, from, from charcoal, where they're sourcing their charcoal from, speaks to a kind of a network of information, speaks to a kind of a network of economic opportunity, um, uh, and then right down through uh, uh, to, to looking at where you buy your, your, your giraffe meat from um, as well. So all these kinds of things are helping us to hopefully kind of bring Pompeii back to life, bring a particular kind of fabric of it, that being the kind of the sub-elite fabric as well, a very much overlooked um, uh, 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 component of a Roman city, and then also to try to connect that history then to, to a bigger kind of Roman world. Uh, and then ultimately to connect it to you all um, by going out and telling people what we're, what we're digging up, what we're finding. So I've raced through that in about 20 minutes. I hope that was brief enough. I certainly invite like questions, uh, but, but above all, I certainly appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. How does the country of Italy decide who's working on this historic site? Uh, uh, they, they, so, so um, not easily. Uh, so you can imagine every archaeologist in the world wants to, wants to work there. Um, when I applied, I got partly lucky with part of the questions that I had with it. So it was one of many hundreds of applications to work at Pompeii at that time. We got the only one. Um, it's now the biggest project in the history of Pompeii. Uh, how did we get it? Um, I got lucky on it. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was the youngest person ever appointed to a dig out there. So it was, every, everything was going against me uh, when I applied. Um, but still, I had that. Or I, had, I guess that, that youthfulness in me, I was... I was too naive and to, to know any better, so I just went for it, and, and I got lucky with it. And then so who funds then your work since then? So, so the who funds it since then is it's it's principally funded by the University of Cincinnati, the Department of Classics there, okay. and then various parts of it are funded by different groups. So the National uh, Endowment of Humanities have funded have funded different parts of the research, either, either at Pompeii or, or when I live in Rome there, um, and then various individuals, families. Some families have funded the excavation of particular houses particular properties. So people want to get involved with the project that way, have, have funded um, these conservation these efforts. Are these or the people live relatively close? And They're not people? Pompeians, no. Oh, I mean no, Americans. Americans. Oh, yeah, okay. it, 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 that speaks to sort of the American philanthropic um, culture that exists here, which, which I, do, I certainly had to get used to. I, you know, I, I, I come from Australia, uh, very much a socialized country, certainly a socialized country as far as education goes. So I wasn't used to, when I, when I moved to America, I had to learn that new language of how funding works. It's a nice language, I like it. <laughs> how, how do you divide your time between there and here? And also, I've heard someone speak about the uh, old uh, utilities, you know, that, that people used to use to, for bathroom, etc. And that's what they used to throw all their treasures in. So there's people in Cincinnati that dig, go down and over the Rhine, etc., and dig in those areas and find pottery and all these treasures that people, that's where they would just throw all their waste. Yeah, so, so the first question, how do I divide my time? I, I, I'm there every summer for about three months, um, mostly in Italy, but then in North Africa as, as well, and France and Spain, um, and Greece too. So I, I, all over the place, I guess, there, uh, for about three months, um, always in, the, in that summer, and then throughout the rest of the year, I go back and forth. So every, it depends on the year, um, but every couple of months, um, every two or three months, I'm back over there, either for a day or for, for, for a week. That sort of amount of time, a week, a week or two. So I'm going in November for a couple of weeks. I'll go back in January for a week, March for a couple of weeks, back again in April for a couple of weeks. You probably know all the travel, the best way to travel and all that kind of stuff. I know stuff. pretty well, yeah. I, and I travel around a lot. Uh, all those little pink dots should give an indication and of that. It's in Marymount now, so I don't know how that works. Yeah, yeah, I, I love, love living in Marymount. You know, getting the, 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 the gig at Cincinnati was a, a dream come true. This is the, the epicenter of Mediterranean archaeology. Um, so it was, it was when, I, when I first left Australia, I went first to Michigan. I had a job, I was a professor there. Uh, I was 
there for two years, and then the Cincinnati job came up, and I, I got lucky again. Right? Yeah. Uh, How'd you inform the crowd what Cincinnati's history is with the flag and etc.? I'm not sure everybody yeah, can so, see it, so to give how some, big a deal this is. Yeah, it's a, Cincinnati's a really, really big deal. Uh, it's, one of, uh, it's one of the biggest um, classics and classical archaeology programs in the world. Uh, it's certainly the richest in the world. And it has the largest, it has the largest, not just the largest, but also the best and the fastest growing than, say, than the second best library on the planet uh, for what we do, for, for classics and the study of ancient, the ancient world. Not just for the study of classics, it's also the world's largest specialized library, is the Department of Classics, is the, the Classics Library at, at Cincinnati. So it's a really big deal. And I say, when I, when I came here, I, yeah, I, I was, for me, it was like coming to, to Nirvana. Um, and so what, how that was born was largely through the right people and again through, through philanthropy. So there was a, I guess, a marriage between the department and the Taft family, um, a, a good guy, Semple Taft. Uh, and they're still very, very heavily involved. And so we're very extraordinarily grateful uh, to them for all that they've done. My, my entire career, my entire life is is now based based upon that and uh, it brought me brought me to beautiful Marymount. So. How has your dig, uh, dig affected the rating of the School of Anthropology, Classics, uh, Archaeology, yeah. excuse me, yeah. Yeah, at UC in the last eight years, maybe. Um, it's, 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 it's hard to sort of point directly, right? It's not like a football program where you can, you can well, see you the know, numbers. You have the DAP program rated <laughs> but, but, yeah, number. But, yeah, but it's, it's certainly, it's yeah. impacted on it. Um, yeah. As proud as I am of it, and the university is of it, uh, and it's a, it's a big name project. Um, that's why you know, Steve Jobs calls us. Right. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio comes and meets with us. So it's it, it gets a lot of good attention for that, but but it's only one of a number of really great projects at, in the Department of Classics um, there. So we also have excavations at Knossos in Crete, which is this extraordinary palace complex. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the suburbs of the palace complex there through Lenny Hatsaki. Um, Pilos, uh, Nestor's Palace from the Mycenaean um, Age, Bronze Age uh, in Greece, working there as well. Um, all over, like Troy, ancient Troy, so really big name, in, in my world, kind of household name projects that come from, from Cincinnati, we're very, very proud. Who determines what is, um, uh, from Italy, now there is a pot, whatever, a pottery or whatever, who determines where it goes or who owns it? Uh, they will always own it. Um, who determines where it goes will always be, they will always determine it, they will always govern where the material goes. I can... Is that Rome itself, in, in Rome, it, or...? No, most of Pompeii. So, at, Pompeii. At, the, at the first level, everything we dig up in Pompeii stays in Pompeii. Yeah. Um, that's, there, there are good and bad outcomes from that. Uh, what I then do is various parts of that record, of that collection, I will then ask to move elsewhere. In the early days, I used to bring a lot of, a lot of material, um, particularly um, environmental material, that we couldn't really study the using machines that go ping, the stuff we wanted to really do with it in Italy, we had to do it back here in the United States. So I'll bring some of the material back to the United States, use our machines that go ping, and then send it send it back. Um, these days, uh, we now we get a lot of material to Rome itself, to the American Academy in Rome. We're one of only two projects sort of affiliated with the American Academy, and that gives us a great big workspace, um, which is great. Frankly, the more stuff we get out of Pompeii, the better, only because, not that we want to we don't want to, it's not like the Elgin Marbles, we're not trying to sort of, we're not really digging up treasures or anything like that, but everything we dig up, if we, we as we keep it in Pompeii, it's secured, the storage is very good, but it's very hard to access it um, at, a, at a very practical level. Um, so the more stuff we can get out into places, storage um, facilities and, and study facilities in places like Rome, then we can actually access the material almost 24 hours a day once it's there. We always give it back, we, we, you know, as I said, we're not digging up treasure, as it were, we're digging up waste. Are you involved in conducting any of those uh, individual archaeological tours of individuals that want to do this? I am. Yeah, I do. I, I've done tours for the Archaeological Institute of America. Um, I've got some coming up um, in this coming year, 2015. Uh, I've got three or four tours for National Geographic um, in this area, going behind the scenes in Pompeii and Sicily and South Italy. And another one for a group called Andante um, Travels. So, yeah, yeah, I do, do some of that. It's a lot of fun. Uh, it's, it's great fun, actually. You get to travel around a bunch of places, 
with really amazing people, the kinds of people who do those tours are, are really self-selected, of course, um, and they, they're good fun to, to be around. So I, I really enjoy, enjoy that side of it, especially the cruise ones. The cruise ones are nice. <laughs> the Tap Museum is here in town, which I don't know if you, well, you've been to it. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering a little bit of payback, if you could put together, maybe years down the road, the art of Pompeii, what you've been able to bring up. But I think that would be an interesting collection. Yeah, we had a, the exhibit at the uh, museum center mm -hmm. about three years ago now, two or three years ago. Okay. Uh, a lot of Pompeii material. Not our stuff, we didn't really, our stuff isn't really, our stories are great. Um, but the actual material, I mean, you look at it, and it's, 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 yeah, there's broken pieces of pottery. I mean, the amazing stories of, of fish salteries and we, we found a, a great big pottery production facility where they were, they were, they were making pottery. For us as archaeologists, it's, it's great stuff, but to put it in a glass cabinet, it won't really get much attention. But, so we had other, other material, the stuff that people actually like. Um, and then what we did, we provided, all my graduate students did bunches of um, uh, docent tours and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Were, were there a lot of uh, written records? I mean, how literate was the general population? I mean. Do you find records, tax records, other kinds of records, not even a library that you know puts a lot of color they, to this, or you just is this a lot of guesswork you're trying to? Yeah, you know, it's uh, the, the short answer is yes and no. Uh, the yes is that they were very they were very literate, um, and so we see that in uh, what, everything from uh, charcoal uh, uh, accounts scribbled on the walls in various shops, telling you the prices of sausages and and, and cheeses and smoked figs and things like this, um, right through to wax tablets that were kept, which kept accounts, which said, you know, I'm doing business with this guy who lives in Naples or this person who lives in Spain. So we had, we had some charcoal on the walls, wax tablets, graffiti, etc. All of it points to a very literate society. There's not just a, a small handful of people writing, but quite a large, well, I wouldn't say majority, but, but it, it seems as though it, it spread further down. Um, the sort of the socioeconomic tree, as it were, the ladder. Um, the no part of the answer is, do we find much of it? No. No. We, 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 we the sort of the history of Pompeian archaeologists over 200 years, have found a good amount of material, but we, as in our excavation, have not uh, been able to find much um, writing uh, at all. It's a shame, because obviously that, that's a, 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 a very illuminating record, but, but it's so hard to, to get. Pompeii kind of a wealthy resort town, or it's it's sometimes labelled as well. It's labelled as either being um, kind of a wealthy resort town, or on the one hand, on the other hand, a kind of a, a very innocuous everyday town. Um, it's actually neither. I, I see it as being neither. But definitely wealthy. Definitely a again, this is sort of my work of putting all those pink dots on the map. There has helped me to sort of understand where does Pompeii fit in the in the grand tour. Of, of cities, it'd be like coming to America and visiting you know, 200 different cities. If you had to then sort of gauge where the Cincinnati fit in the, in the grand scheme of things, it's it was certainly not, um, it's certainly neither the, the, the sort of resort town or an everyday town. It was a it was a re, I would I would describe it as a regionally prominent city, um, which is vague on the one hand but specific on the other. As far as tiers go, um, you've got places like Rome. Constantinople, Alexandria, Corinth would be, maybe Athens, probably not, um, but those cities, must say, would be the top, the actual top. And then there'd be kind of, it's kind of daylight down to the next stage where you've got these important cities, and I'd say Pompeii would be probably in that group there. Just like Cincinnati, you know, compared to New York and Los Angeles. Yeah, and yeah probably. Like that. Yeah, probably. Regionally important, yeah. but not, it's not. Los Angeles or New York City, um, but it's sort of the, the next, the next phase, next, next group down. Well, it's kind of interesting parallel. I mean, because I mean, excavating a city like yeah. sort of our level. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Um, do any of the uh, first century historical sources have much uh, information that's useful? Uh, uh, great, great, great question. I mean, I've been writing about. I'm writing this book right now on the, on the history of the Roman retail industry, and I'm, so I'm writing about a topic that doesn't feature a lot. But, but there's still a great amount of complexity and sophistication in the study of it. It's really fascinating. And it brings me to your question because Pompeii is often seen, coming back both, to link both questions up, Pompeii is often, by archaeologists and 
historians to lift off the register of historical information of the first century because it's only found in half a dozen or so, half a dozen or ten um, accounts, historical accounts that, that some ancient historian or ancient author of, of whatever genre will use the word Pompeii. Uh, so it's a Pliny, Pliny the Elder, for example, tells us that it's, it's he's writing about everything, he's writing this encyclopedia, and he says, well, if you want to get good fish sauce, Pompeii is one of the great places for it. So that's, that's where you get these little, these little snippets. But what, I would, what I've been arguing in my book is that for people that say, well, we can't really use the text that much because they completely ignore Pompeii, um, I would argue differently to that. I say we just need to read them better so that even though the texts don't write specifically about Pompeii, the texts certainly write about a, 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 a Roman world, a kind of a cultural milieu in which Pompeii was, in, was, a, was, a, was a participant. So there's certainly a part of the text. So, the, so these, these texts are written by elites in Rome, typically about Rome, but they're writing about a world in which Pompeii was certainly not like foreign. Like Manhattan and Brooklyn. Not foreign, yeah. Yeah, like a you know, history book. Um, Dad McCullough writes a book about American history. He doesn't happen to mention Cincinnati anywhere in it. But I bet you Cincinnati fits in it. Maybe his book on the... Are you writing a book now? Hmm. Have yeah. you written other books? I have. I have. I've, I've written another book. Uh, I wrote a book called the, the, the Making of Pompeii, which was sort of the getting a whole bunch of different archaeological projects and sort of putting all that information together to try to get a sense of it. It's very think, academic. It's not a fun book to read. Do you have libraries or anything? Or oh, yeah. At, 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 at university libraries. Oh, really? Yeah. I would dissuade you from reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I really would. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not written. I mean, it's, it is written by an archaeologist for archaeologists. It's one of those books that academics write, where we, 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 we think about three people. We, 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 we will literally write books to, to two other people in the world. Literally do that. I mean, we, we don't, we're not thinking about anybody else, except what that person is wow. doing and what their research is doing. We write a book to that mark. And then we know that the trickle down, we some, some, you know, other, other professors and archaeologists will read historians and graduate students. Maybe they will give it to some of their undergraduates, but it won't really stand farther than that. The other books I'm doing right now, so I'm doing a book right now uh, uh, which is on this re retailing history, looking at shops and, and commerce and, and how they came to sort of shape, shape Roman cities and the network behind them, etc. Um, and then I've got the, the actual excavations I'm also writing up now as well. So there's um, four books from these excavations. And I've got another project in Greece that I'm writing up as a book. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit overwhelming right, right now. Uh, doctor, when I was over there, uh, you know, you're going along with a bunch of people, and they said they, these Italians would throw their garbage out in the gutter. Was that not really they did true? Those? No, no, well, a little bit. We, we, we read a bit about that happening where they would get chamber pots and just pour them out on the street, things like that. The streets themselves, um, go back. See these curbstones? See how high they are? The reason it is, come back, oh, uh, there there. I'll find a good example. All these curb stones here, and these little crossing stones, if you keep a keen eye, we'll see some of these crossing stones. There's a lot of water on the streets of Pompeii, um, and that would wash a lot of material the water away. Would wash yeah, but they mostly, away yeah, it would wash it away somewhere, but they mostly organized it. It wasn't, they were mostly kind of organic scraps that would get tossed yeah. out that way. Right. But they organized their trash differently, in other words. So, so they, had, they had wooden um, trash piles, they had, they had building material trash piles, they had, they had uh, pottery trash piles, glass trash piles, huh. um, all the different kinds of materials, and then they would all be then used differently. Um, Where does the water come from? Oh, the water comes from, the water comes <laughs> rain. Um, that is partly, partly rain. So it's, the water comes from, um, Initially, there's two answers. So the, so the first answer, the earlier answer, is that it all came from rainwater, and the, and the roofs were, were pitched so that the roof tiles would, would channel all that rain. Um, so the more roof space you had, the more rainwater you could collect, and it would go into an underground system underneath. So we dig up these all the time, we find these, and then Augustus, this first emperor, comes along, and he says, hey, we can do better than that, and he gives them an aqueduct. So suddenly they go from having quite a lot of, ra quite a lot of water, because we've calculated it, We've calculated the amount of roof space, and we've calculated the size, the, the volume of the systems on the ground, and we've calculated by, by being there, what's
watching the rain falling, and we go get on the on the meteorological charts that day, and we get the the, the rate of rainfall, and we can actually work out what type of storm it would take and how long would that rain would take to fill up a great big underground system. But then, so you imagine, uh, and really, the short answer that is not very long. Right? So they've got a lot of water in these systems underground. Then when the and the aqueduct came, what that brought was was pressurized water um, through their lead pipes, and so their fountains and water spurting out, things like that. Um, and what that gave them was was too much water because you can't turn it off. Once you, you connect this, this aqueduct with the mountains, 50 miles that way, once it gets to you, you can't turn off. So much so that you actually had to set up these towers so that aqueduct water would hit these towers and shoot up the tower up into a great big basin on top, collect in the basin, and it'd be, it would be high enough to, to, to reduce the force of that water, just to sort of slow it down, um, and then high enough to then have it drain back down with enough force to get to the next thing. Um, hmm. so the engineering is quite, quite amazing. Yeah, they had their own plumbing. I mean, they yeah, still plumbing had their pipes and stuff. Yeah, they had. Uh, 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 yeah, we we being up toilets, up, uh, up, uh, upper floor toilets, um, drainage piping, uh, all of it. These guys that live in our neighbourhood didn't really have lead pipes, uh, but we do see lead pipes a lot. They're the ones who typically the, the larger houses that were connected. Their pipes to the aqueduct supply uh, as well, so they could pressurise that water and, and, and set up taps and channel it and move it around and stuff. If I remember, I, I thought I saw clay pipes. Maybe. Yeah, most, you'll mostly see clay pipes. Yeah. Yeah. Is, there, is there any truth to that, that there's the lead pipes cause a lot of lead, lead illness, lead disease? And well, again, yes and no. The they, and they, had, um, they, 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 they knew it. They knew, I guess the, the ultimate answer is that they knew about lead poisoning. And they knew that what you had to do is you had to wait for the sinter, which the calcite deposits to form on the inside of the lead pipe. So they waited for the sinter to develop, and then they would drink from that water. How long it took them to figure that out, I don't know. <laughs> um, because I, I, I just don't know the answer. I know that they're, at least in the first century, they're not drinking that water until it gets the calcium deposits um, built up uh, on the inside of it. Uh, but I don't know if, sort of when that comes in, that kind of awareness comes in. This is a question for my wife. She can't be here. She loves dogs, and there were millions of dogs mm. in there, just yeah. roaming all over the place. You want to take them all home? But yeah. We're not gonna do that. Uh, are they still there? They're still are they, there. Are they okay? They're okay. They're okay. They're very okay. Um, there's a dog problem, I suppose. Uh, it was worse in, in, in past years. Basically, because of the the, the, the there's a there's a dog sanctuary there, so people come and dump dogs in that yeah. pipe. Don't they be looked after? And then. Uh, interestingly enough, I've seen hundreds of dogs come and go, but I've also seen a certain number of dogs are the same dogs there every single year. Uh, I've, I've known dogs to have lived there for 12 years, uh, just on the, on the streets. Uh, they live in certain parts of Pompeii. They're, they're not just fed, but they're overly fed. They reject food. They don't need food. Uh, the local butchers will come out to the main piazza where the sanctuary is um, every morning and give out all these off-cuts of their meat. Um, so they're they're kind of looked after pretty well. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there, there, are, there are worse conditions for homeless dogs than, than here in Pompeii. Some of them have been brought back to the United States. So uh, very good. Well, we'll uh, plan on seeing you next month, and everyone be safe.